insect as food could ease some of the burden on the climate, at least according to someone featured on today's program. And an outstanding 2,000 species are edible. So we invite you to the table. Welcome to Echo Africa. I'm Chris Elems from Lagos, Nigeria. Hi there, I am Sandra Twinovio and I'm glad you've chosen to tune in in this week's episode of Eco Africa. We have a lot of interesting topics on the environment from Africa and Europe on today's program. Here's a quick look at what is coming up shortly. We'll discover how much effort a plastic collector in Somalia puts into making recycled products and see what kind of ideas people come up with in Kenya when sanitation facilities are lacking. If mankind will not change its eating habits, researchers predict that we also need additional farmland twice the size of India. This sounds like madness, doesn't it? Especially in light of what nature has to offer as an alternative. Eat more insects is the slogan of a scientist from Zimbabwe. His idea that the agri-food sector has to be rethought comes together with a new cookbook he has just published, Bon Appetit. What many find creepy is pure gold to Kilian Ruzande. The 30-year-old teaches farmers in Zimbabwe how to turn their waste into resources, as at this pig waste dump on a farm near Harare. And insects like these black soldier fly larvae make potent animal feed for free. Pupa or a thousand pre-pupa like these ones that you've just harvested there in the dirt, you can sell them 50 US dollars. So to me, uh, this is money. To me, this is life, yes. And as nature does it, as it's been recycled, we are going to get some manure there that we are going to be putting in our garden. So nature doesn't waste anything. To me, there's nothing that, that is called waste. At the Chinhoi University of Technology, entomologist Robert Musundire and his colleagues prepare a unique cooking class. They have created, then published, several insect dishes in a cookbook. The Zimbabwean Broadcast Corporation produces a cooking show thanks to the book. The hope is that the recipes can be used as a marketing strategy that popularizes bugs as environmentally friendly ingredients. They also have iron, a very rich source of iron. For several years, studies have been conducted at the small university. The entomologist looks at different insect species that are suitable for human consumption and ways to prepare them. His view is that insects can become an affordable and accessible source of protein in Zimbabwe, where six million people are malnourished. We have done a lot of studies uh, with a variety of insect species that are edible. We found out that in terms of uh, the protein content, it ranges from 30% to uh, around 69% uh, on dry matter basis. Then we go on uh, antioxidants. We are quite excited. Our studies have shown that termites, uh, and as well as the edible stink bugs, they have high levels of antioxidants. But stink bugs and termites are not usually seen as delicacies, and many people are averse to eating insects. But now there are around 40 species that have been classified as edible for humans. Um, I used not to eat these uh, edible insects because I didn't know about them. I didn't know how, how to prepare them. I didn't know what, they, what value they are to us. And um, because uh, even my parents did not even uh, bring them to the table. So we're now trying to make sure we're bringing them to the table. But buying edible insects can be difficult. Most are poached in the wild and sold informally and only in season. Insects can be bred, but without a formal market, farmers who do so are scarce. With the Chinhoi Edible Insects Market, the first of its kind in Zimbabwe, Robert Musundire and the Swedish International Development Cooperation, Agrifosa, have created retail and storage space for three female traders to sell insects year-round. So what we are saying here is we, we want to prolong the shelf life, we want to maintain quality, we want to promote food safety. So this facility really provides uh, those attributes to our product. As you can see, they also have an opportunity to package 
into, into, into small plastics. We are already eliminating food contaminants. Musundire views this market as the first seed planted in the creation of a formal value chain for edible insects in Zimbabwe. It's a small start and there are still few clients, but shopkeepers who started just a few weeks ago are optimistic that business will soon pick up. Most people like insects. They like them very much. So business of insects is a good business. Back on the farm, Ruzande builds a black soldier fly breeder. He believes that insect farming is a good business idea because insects make very efficient livestock and have minimal environmental impact. Producing one kilogram of beef requires about 16,000 liters of water. Creating the same amount of cricket protein would only need 100 liters. Insects for human consumption that is uh, a project that I'm actually also working on, uh, a project that uh, involves uh, crickets and some of our indigenous uh, locusts. So I see profits and money here. Yeah. Although insect animal feed production was largely unknown in Zimbabwe just a few years ago, it's starting to take hold. The same could happen with edible insects for human consumption, especially if it makes environmental and business sense. I would like to get a copy of that cookbook. Reading it just might increase my appetite for insects. But now, our next report takes us to Mogadishu, the capital of Somalia. It is a city marked by decades of conflict and war. Yes, indeed, Sandra, but also devastation caused by drought and floods, as well as pollution, are causing misery. And because there are so many problems to deal with for many people there, Environmental protection is not the most pressing concern, but there are exceptions, as you see in this week's Doing Your Bits. The streets of Mogadishu are full of trash. The government funds only a few trucks for the mammoth task of collecting it all, with the result that most is left lying. That's why Abdallah Timada has been getting up early every day for a year now to collect plastic bottles. A rather odd sight in Mogadishu. The main challenge is that people stare at you and laugh when you're collecting bottles on the road. They think you're mad. But I'm optimistic that we'll overcome these challenges and that it won't stop us. But instead, it'll encourage us to do more. But while others laugh at him, the Somali is busy making money with his unusual activity. Abdallah Timada turns the used plastic bottles into decorative vases. He sells them complete with flowers or tree seedlings in his shop and online as well. The business is just getting underway. My main goal is for every house in the city to plant a tree, especially fruit trees. And that all these plants are planted on waste plastic bottles to help the environment. Twenty percent of Somalia's trash consists of plastic. Abdallah Timada says every effort to reduce the problem is essential, and he's making the start. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Around 90% of city dwellers in Europe are exposed to pollutants that could harm their health, according to the European Environmental Agency. And in fact, air pollution contributes to the premature death of some 400,000 people there every year. Our next report comes from the capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina, where the situation is particularly bad. It is yet another day of misery for Edis Hajimojevic. Smog, especially in winter, is a huge problem in Sarajevo, and it is getting worse. 
Days like today are a torment for people like Eris, who suffer from asthma. Last night I inhaled a second dose. Normally, I just take one dose per day. Just talking briefly in the polluted air stresses Edis so much that he has to inhale yet again. Smog is making more and more people ill. According to a World Bank report, every year over 3,000 people in Bosnia die from the effects of pollution. Every year, Professor Dizdarevic diagnoses more patients with chronic respiratory diseases. Her findings are clear. I can say with certainty that there's a direct link between air pollution and lung disease. In other words, smog harms all organs in the body. This scares chronically ill people like Edis Hajimožević because now, during the corona pandemic, it puts him in the highest risk group. Because of COVID and air pollution, I go out as little as possible. For example, only when I must go shopping or when I have a business appointment. Then he has to head downtown, where the air is especially bad. 150,000 cars make their way through Sarajevo every day, many of them old, with very high emission levels. In winter, there is additional pollution from stoves, often heated with anything that burns. Smog hangs over the valley basin of Sarajevo. The view from one of the surrounding hills shows how big the problem is. On a normal sunny winter day, the city literally disappears in smog. Experts say the modern high-rise buildings are also partly to blame. They impede the airflow in the city. Better urban planning and more public transport are needed, explains the Minister of Environment and Urban Development. We meet him on his last day at work. He is frustrated. With the help of the EU, his ministry had developed a phased plan to tackle the city's environmental problems. But then there were elections in Sarajevo, and the new cantonal government simply dissolved his ministry. What they're doing is simply criminal, and someone should be held responsible. In my opinion, this is pure corruption. The new majority and the new government simply decided that there will be no more spatial planning, no more urban development, and therefore no more attempts to improve air quality. Years of planning in vain. He blames the construction sector lobby. That's just mafia. Mafia. Eris does not believe anything will change in the foreseeable future. Today, of all days, he must go to the office, located on the main road in the city centre. I have to go to work today. It's really hard for me to breathe, because the air is so bad. Smog, asthma, and on top of that, the corona threat. For Eris, winter is torture. Avocados are among the most controversial superfoods. While many swear by their nutritional value, others criticize the way the plant is cultivated. The avocado trend is especially widespread in the countries of the global north, and it seems to be increasing. Here in Nigeria, farmers see it as a way of securing a new income stream. Producers have begun to farm avocados on a large scale. But is there a way to grow the plants more sustainably? Echo Africa takes a look at some eco-friendly avocado fields. It's a small cut that promises great results. Adeni Sholabumi is showing other farmers how to graft avocado plants. He slices a jumbo avocado cutting onto a smaller Hass avocado plant already growing in soil. Hass avocados are smaller than the standard jumbo variety found at the local markets. More and more farmers in Nigeria want to grow avocados because they are far more profitable than other crops. Nicknamed Green Gold, the global appetite for avocados is soaring, especially in Europe and the US. But growing them requires huge water supplies. 
But the Hess variety, which Shola Bumi works, requires less water. Adeni Ibumi has learned environmentally friendly methods to farm them in Kenya and Israel. Farmers in these two countries are very experienced with cultivating avocados in dry soils. We know that as avocado is a huge feeder, it takes a lot of um, nutrient of the soil. So we make sure that we have compost in place that we are putting as uh, back into the soil because we're trying to practice an organic um, system of production. With his company, Go Green Africa, he wants to export to the European market. Peter Kariuki is an avocado expert from Kenya. He regularly gives Bumi cultivation advice. Bumi attended one of his training sessions and now trains other farmers in Nigeria. Kariuki also taught him how to prepare the earth. The best method is to mix coconut fibers with the sandy soil underneath. The cocoa peat will like to will, will absorb some water and put and uh, like uh, it's like a sponge. It will take the water from the all the other sides of the soil and put it near to the to the to the to the to the, to the seedling or your tree. So all the time your tree will be moist. You see. So with with the, the drip irrigation, that type of irrigation, all the time you see that you have water, 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 water. So the ecosystem, we won't we won't waste a lot of water trying to feed these avocado trees. It takes 2,000 liters to produce one kilogram of avocados, compared with one kilogram of oranges, which need only 500 liters of water. Avocado cultivation is therefore best in areas with abundant water supplies like Ogun. Farmer Olarotimi sows his crop fields here too. Since training with Adeni Ibumi, he also uses drip irrigation for growing peppers. With this new method, we could set up a drip irrigation system that makes water availability within the environment stable while we also continue with our crop production without one uh, affecting the other adversely. Olarotimi wants to grow avocados too. He can order organic has seedlings from abroad for around one euro each. The investment does pay off. After two to three years, he can earn almost 30 euros per kilogram of avocados, a much higher price than with other fruits and vegetables. Currently, Nigeria doesn't have a big avocado export. Last year, about 120 avocado farmers joined forces to change that. And there are always training sessions where the farmers want to learn how to cultivate. Former Nigerian President Olusha Gwambasanjo now heads the Avocado Association Nigeria. He's lobbying to massively expand the country's avocado export. Avocado has been with us for ages, but we did not fully appreciate its value. Adeni Sholabumi wants to further promote avocado cultivation in Nigeria. He knows if farmers here learn how to use less water and conserve resources, they can increase their profits. Now for a problem that's extremely urgent for many people all over the world, access to clean water and to clean toilets. According to a report from the World Bank, Nearly 700 million people have no access to a toilet. Unfortunately, that is true. And the problem is even getting worse in sub-Saharan Africa, thanks to the growing population. In Kibera, an informal settlement on the edge of Kenya's capital, Nairobi, it is feared that this problem will lead to more rapid spread of diseases. But one local initiative is approaching this issue in a playful way. Uh -oh. likes there to be a festive atmosphere when she makes her cell speech, but there's a serious matter at stake. Today, I want to show you how we can make our neighborhood cleaner. What's this? And where do these bugs land when we've used them? On our roofs, in our streets, and in our water. Would you like to change this situation? Anne works for People, a company that wants to improve access to hygienic toilets. 
How many of you know about people a new kind of toilet? It will help make things cleaner and healthier. It's not just a bug. There are chemicals inside which fight the smell and kill harmful bacteria. That was in 2013. No sewerage, no real toilets. Instead, these single-use plastic bags were meant to solve the sanitation problem in shanty towns. Kibera, on the outskirts of the Kenyan capital Nairobi, is one of the biggest informal settlements in Africa. It's estimated that between 300,000 and 1 million people live here, but it's impossible to know exactly. Anne grew up here. She knows the nicer side of Kibera. But also the bad sides. Garbage collects in the streets. The biggest problem is that people don't know what to do with their own bodily waste. Nobody has a toilet in their home. When nature calls, people are forced to use the few open spaces or use plastic bags, which they then throw away. The result is that fecal matter spreads diseases like typhus and cholera. Diarrheal diseases are one of the leading causes of death here. Kibera is a typical of many places in the world where people have no access to adequate sanitation. The World Health Organization says it's a situation that affects them 2 billion people. Thanks to people toilet, the situation in Kibera is changing because waste is collected instead of being thrown onto the roof. <laughs> yeah, we are coming to collect the, the used to people. Did you have? Yes. That's Rebecca and Silo's task. The bag toilets may look like the old flying toilets, but they are actually something totally different. The bag contains five grams of artificial urea. When it comes into contact with feces, it produces ammonia gas. That kills the pathogens in human excretions. We used to throw the flying toilets on the rails, but when the railway line was cleaned, the workers just threw everything back. Sometimes you could barely walk out of the door without stepping in it. Our children were often sick and had diarrhea. With the new bags, this has improved. At night, it is also dangerous to go out here. Time and again, women are raped in Kibera, who are looking for a place where they can do their business, and the few public toilets are far away and closed at night. These single-use toilets give women more freedom and safety, but it's not for free. Each bag costs three Kenyan shillings, about three euro cents. For a daily family income of one or two euros, it gets expensive, especially in a larger family. Nevertheless, the project has been a success. How does it look today? Kibera has developed. On the age of the settlement, there are now apartment blocks. There are sealed roads, and the government has built public toilets. Here, residents can not only use hygienic toilets, but they can also shower. The facilities still aren't enough for all the people who live here. All the same, it's a big improvement. And the people bugs? Demand has fallen, thanks to these positive developments. But they're still used in more than 100 schools in Kibera. Hard to believe, but we've come to the end of this week's program. Thanks for watching. For now, it's bye from Lagos, Nigeria. See you again next time. And in the meantime, why don't you write to us? We would like to get your feedback on the show. You can reach us on our social media channels that you can see on the screen. I am Sandra Twinobidu. All the best and stay healthy. Bye-bye from Kampala, Uganda. No.